Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening if you're on the other side of the Atlantic. And welcome to this Konrad Adenauer Stiftung CSIS webinar on the future of German security and defense policy. This is the last event in a series we've been running together with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, looking at Germany at the end of the Merkel era. You know, 15 years on, we can, or 16 years on, I suppose, we, we can look at um, a long history, um, now four US presidents, and there's a lot to talk about. Our past events have examined Germany's foreign policy and role in the world. We've looked specifically at Germany's policy, for example, towards the Western Balkans, but it's a pleasure to focus today specifically on the security and defense aspects of German policy to include the impact on the transatlantic relationship. We'll begin this discussion with our two experts, Dr. Krause and, and Dr. Schaka in a moment, but right now I'd like to give the floor to Paul Linatz, director of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, to give us some opening remarks and introduce our two discussants. Paul, over to you. Thank you, dear Rachel. Good morning also from my side to our participants in the US. Good evening to all our participants in Europe. Um, please uh, let me first express my uh, sincere gratitude to Rachel and CSIS for hosting not only today's, but also the previous online events. With us, it has been a true pleasure. Thank you so much. As, as Rachel mentioned, before we are going to start our discussion, I would like to at least briefly, but warmly, welcome and introduce our distinguished panelists and our moderator today. Dr. Corey Shaki is a um, senior fellow and the director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute here in Washington, DC. Thank you so much for joining us, Corey. Before joining AEI, she was the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. Corey has had a distinguished career in government working at the US State Department, the US Department of Defense and the National Security Council at the White House. She has also taught at Stanford, West Point, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, National Defense University, and the University of Maryland. Corey Chucky is the author of several books, among them in 2018, I think, America versus the West, Can the Liberal World Order Be Preserved? She is also the co-editor, along with former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, of Warriors and Citizens, American Views of Our Military, which was published in 2016. Kori Shaki has a PhD and MA in government and politics from the University of Maryland, as well as an MPM to our European audience, a Master of Public Management from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Her BA in international relations is from Stanford University. Professor Dr. Joachim Krause is the director of the Institute for Security Policy at Kiel University since close to 20 years already. He was a professor of international politics and director of the Institute of Social Sciences at the Christian Albrechts University in Kiel from 2001 to 2016. From 1993 to 2001, he has been deputy director of the Research Institute of the German Council on Foreign Relations in Bonn, private lecturer at the universities of Potsdam and Bonn, and from 1978 until 1993, he has worked first as a research associate and later as head of the research secretariat at the Research Institute of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, perhaps known as the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, SWP. Joachim Krause is co-editor of the journal Internationale Politik or International Politics since 2005, and he is one of the editors of the Jahrbuch Terrorismus, the yearbook on terrorism, since its first edition in 2006, one of the leading security policy publications in the German-speaking world. Joachim Krause studied political science in Hamburg, earned his doctorate at the Freie Universität or Free University of Berlin and his habilitation at the University of Bonn. 
It's great to have you with us as well. Last but not least, Rachel Elhus. I think last time we met um, was during an event at uh, GMF in late 2019 before COVID struck. And I'm so happy that at least virtually we could kind of bridge the gap during the last few months and meet each other again. Rachel is Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the Europe, Russia and Eurasia program at CSIS. Her research focuses on the future of NATO, the transatlantic relationship, US-EU relations, and regional security and defense dynamics, particularly in Northern Europe and the Arctic. Before coming to CSIS, Rachel served as Principal Director for European and NATO Policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the US Department of Defense. From 2009 to 2012, Rachel was based in London, assigned to the Strategic Unit in the UK Ministry of Defense. Prior to her work at the Department of Defense, she was a researcher at the Danish Institute of International Affairs and also lived in Prague where she worked at the East-West Institute. Rachel holds a BA in International Relations and German from Colgate University and an MA in Political Science and European Affairs from the College of Europe in Bruges in Brussels, in Belgium. Rachel will lead us through today's discussion and I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much to all our panelists. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paul, for that introduction. It's always difficult, I think, for panelists to, to, to hear the lengthy list of their careers, and it just gets longer suggesting all of us are getting at once more experienced and perhaps a bit older. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for, for that kind introduction. Uh, judging by the size of our crowd, I know we have a lot of interest in today's topic um, on both sides of the Atlantic. So I wanted to start the discussion with you, Dr. Klaus, because you're based in Germany. Could you perhaps give us a sense of what the mood is on the ground surrounding the elections? Is the campaign season in full swing? Or is the public engaged uh, on the issues? Um, how does it feel where you sit? Yeah, the campaign has got um, more, more dynamic in the, in the past few days. Um, and. Um, but a lot of people are undecided. You know, there are opinion polls, but you cannot count so much on the opinion polls because many people sh swift their, shift their, their, their allegiances. The point is uh, there's not one or two main issues where the parties diverge. I think all agree that um, climate policy is very important, but otherwise other things are also important. And, it's more or less, uh, meanwhile, in competition about competence. You know, this has become the main main problem, uh, for, and uh, or the main main focus. Um, and um, but any any kind, anyhow, we will see not a single party uh, being able to to take over government. Maybe we will not even see a two party coalition, but a three party coalition, which is the most likely outcome. I think. And that's certainly an issue that I want to come back to at the end is this idea of a mandate that even if we do get a government coalition, what type of a mandate will they have to deal with some of these difficult security and defense issues that, that are on the docket? Corey, what are you seeing as, as you follow the German elections? You recently wrote a nice piece for, for the American Institute for German Studies, for example, on the history of the US-German relationship um, and, and our defense of Berlin after the Second World War. How closely are you following these elections and what are the main issues you're hearing that, that we care about on this side of the Atlantic? I do think this is a particularly important German election because of course, Angela Merkel's long tenure at the helm of German national security policy. A couple of issues I'm watching. I'm watching for attitudes about China because I think Merkel has taken a particularly soft view on China and is behind the recalibration that other European countries have made as China's behavior becomes more malevolent. Uh, so I think that's one big issue. The second issue is looking at uh, the ease with which Germany ignored other European concerns about Nord Stream 2. I'd be interested what, how candidates in the election size that up because Germany is Europe's leader 
And uh, it's unbecoming for Germany to try and sustain the position that, you know, multilateralism is the key to security and then be deaf to concerns about Germany's own choices. So I think that's a second big issue. A third issue for me is how Germans, not so much the government, but the German public makes their peace with Afghanistan. If they conclude from the tragedy unfolding in Afghanistan now that Germany ought not to have participated these last 19 years, uh, I think that'll be a very important signal both to Germany's friends and to Europe and the transatlantic relationships, potential adversaries. Uh, and lastly, I will be watching to see how uh, defense spending and the many failures of support to the Bundeswehr across Angela Merkel's tenure whether that draws much criticism and much support for strengthening Germany's own military. Thank you. Those are certainly four issues that I think we want to delve in today. Uh, Dr. Krause, did you have a reaction to that? I mean, Corey mentioned China, Russia, Afghanistan, defense spending. I think sort of the common theme for me among these four issues is the extent of German leadership we can expect on these issues. Um, you know, certainly there's a German national policy um, of working economically with China or cooperating on energy with Russia. Is that a tension that you're seeing in this election dynamic and in the discussions about German interests versus European interests? And how might um, we view Merkel's legacy on these four issues um, and, and anticipate what might come next? Yeah, this is a long question. and. Um... I'm afraid I cannot answer it within two minutes, but you know, the Merkel legacy in defense policy is um, in stark contrast to her otherwise very positive leg legacy. I think she has absolutely no strategic thinking. Uh, you know, she, she doesn't think military strategically. And one of her most important quotations is that you cannot solve political problems by military means. That is nice in, in, in theory, but it, it doesn't work out in, in the practice. And uh, I don't think that she has really got it. Um, and she has also dip difficulties with the institutions of security and defense in, in Germany. For instance, she has no real relationship to the central, to, to the federal intelligence agency. And I think she is still unfamiliar with the German Bundeswehr. Um, and, but currently, you know, with the Afghanistan events, um, she is hunted by her failures in the field of defense policy. Yesterday, in the fir first channel of the German public TV, one commentator asked, does anybody know whether Mrs. Merkel had ever delivered a keynote or Grundsatzrede, as we say in Germany, on defense issues? And he said, we found none. And he was right. You know, she gave some speeches at the Munich security conferences, but none of the speeches qualified as a key speech uh, in which she was outlining defense policy. And I think this is her legacy. She didn't care about defense policy, defense issues. She did care about the Bundeswehr. She, um, yes, she cared about the Atlantic Alliance, but on, she did so many things which uh, were contradictory to this Atlantic Alliance orientation. And um, she also has not been uh, accessible to analysis that show that Russia is posing a military threat to Germany again. Um, in particular, not uh, that we now have a, a medium range missile threat against Germany, which very much, which looks somewhat similar to the threat we had in the 1970s. And when I recall then German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, he sounded the alarm bell at that time and he made it a big issue because he uh, was knowing that this was uh, a ploy to disentangle US and German defense and security interest. Today, we are in a similar situation, but there are absolutely no reactions by our chancellor. And, uh, you know, she's usually known for her composure in vis-a-vis in, uh, -vis, uh, crisis, uh, but I have the feeling that composure here turns into apathy. But on the other side, she's not a Putin whisperer. You know, she 
she knows Putin very well and she has had very unfriendly en encounters with him, but she still sticks to the idea that she could keep peace by talking to Putin and by, you know, assuaging him or by by keeping him away from, do, from doing more stupid things. But, and she has no feeling that, you know, a good, dis, a good diplomacy means that you first have to, have to um, you know, provide the means. Uh, and this also means military means. So, um, and during her tenure, the Bundeswehr has sent, was sent out and neglected a process that, which is now being reversed. Um, but for many years, the Ministry of Defense was a piggy bank for the nation. And the Bundeswehr is under equipment or has equipment which is, is outdated or subject to attrition. Currently, we have just one brigade of the German army, which is able to fight under conditions of a, of a high-tech uh, combat environment. And um, we have made promises to NATO countries to to be present with three divisions by 2032, um, but we're far away from implementing this. This is because the social democratic coalition partner has objected, but the chancellor, you know, she simply let this, uh, has let this go. So this is her legacy, but during the past few days, we have seen with regard to the catastrophe in Afghanistan, that many people ask, you know, what what were the reasons why this has happened? And uh, the criti criticism goes into the direction that there was basically no planning, no plan, no master plan, or not a single plan. And frankly speaking, Germany was only in Afghanistan because to, you know, to demonstrate to the United States that we are uh, entrusted allies who are there where the Americans are. Uh, and to our public, uh, the government said this was done in order to, to help Afghan women and, and children. But basically, we had no strategy and the whole alliance had no strategy until 2009. But this strategy has failed, by the way. So um, if there, you know, I don't think that, that we, will, no, we will say goodbye to any kind of this endeavors. But uh, if there will be another endeavor of that kind, it must be premediated much more and must be planned and it must be, there must be a strategic purpose for it. And you know, what many people today are criticizing with uh, Mrs. Merkel is that she had no strategic purpose anyhow in, in the field of, 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 uh, of international security. And this relates to Russia, that relates to China where she has a very benign view of China. Um, and I hope that this will change with a new, a new governing coalition. Well, that's certainly a tough verdict, Dr. Klausa, but I, I think many in our audience might agree with that. I was looking at, at Ms. Merkel's comments um, on Afghanistan, and I think she was pretty observant on some of the shortcomings. Um, she noted uh, among the things that might change uh, was nation building. Would we really get into a nation building exercise again without clear end states? Um, she spoke a lot about European dependence on the US um, and that essentially once the decision was made by the US to withdraw from Afghanistan, Germany and other nations were, were left without a choice. And then finally, this issue that you raised of trust. Um, would What does this pretend for the transatlantic relationship and the fact that Germany's political will was essentially very much tied to wanting to be a good ally to the US and Afghanistan. Um, so I, I think, you know, despite her shortcomings, she's been pretty reflective on those. Um, and with that, you know, Corey, I know you've been answering a lot of questions in recent days on, on Afghanistan. Um, what are you seeing as, you know, the impact on our allies and our relationship with our allies and on the NATO alliance going forward? Um, you know, for example, We've seen some of the candidates trying to differentiate themselves in recent days on Russia and China, but there hasn't been a lot of discussion, as far as I can see, on defense spending. Do you think the experience in Afghanistan appears to be a wake-up call for Germany and, and other NATO allies? Oh, God, I despair at that question, my friend, because my entire professional life there have been wake up calls for Europeans to do more for their own defense. 
and they just keep not doing it. Um, and so, uh, you know, the conversation in the United States is not that sympathetic to European complaints about all we're doing badly in Afghanistan and how that may call into question uh, the tr our willingness to defend Europe. I think most Americans have an enormous amount of affection for our European allies. Most Americans have a greater willingness to fight and defend the uh, independence and sovereignty of our European allies. I would point out actually that more Americans are willing to fight to defend Germany than Germans say they are willing to fight to defend Germany. But there will also be exasperation in the United States at you know, the, the bevy of criticism coming from Europe right now and the need to be reassured that the United States won't abandon Europe even though we abandoned Afghanistan. Um, and quite a lot of Americans um, are likely to respond, Europe and in particular Germany can and should be doing a lot more for itself before you complain about what the United States isn't doing for you. That's an, that's an entirely fair assessment and, and you've watched that over many years and it's, it's good to look at the historical examples of what has spurred action and what, what has not. So Dr. Krause, turning to you on this issue of Germany's commitment to NATO, um, defense spending, you mentioned Germany's defense plans to um, improve the quality and readiness of those brigades, but yet the fact that that plan is not necessarily um, realistic or, or coming to fruition. Um, what were the reasons that, other than Merkel's disengagement, as you mentioned, from, from defense issues, that that hasn't happened in the last 16 years? Um, and do you hold more op optimistic prospects for um, Germany continuing to increase its defense spending, both quantitative and qualitatively, and to be um, that proactive member of NATO that the U.S. is looking for. Yeah, the problem is in Germany, we have a coalition government. And um, if the Christian Democratic Party was in power alone, it would not be such a problem. But we have the Social Democratic Party, which has moved to the left during the past few years. And moving to the left means that they have a very peacenik ideas of international relations. Arms control is the whole thing, avoiding escalation and um, doing uh, you know, business with Russia. And um, you know, this, this is one of the coalition parties. And um, the Christian Democratic Party, which um, until Mrs. Merkel was very defense oriented, has become very silent on this issue. And there are very few politicians within the CDU who are really defense oriented today and who make a strong point. Even uh, with the, you know, the Christian social, social Union, the CSU in Bavaria, they have a leader um, who is much more close to Russia than, than to others and the, than to the US. So the, the picture is, is very difficult. And my hope is that with, uh, in case Mr. Laschet would become uh, um, uh, chancellor, the, the next chancellor, he has promised to be more alliance oriented, to be wholeheartedly part of the Western alliance, not as Mrs. Merkel, who always said some other things uh, which were important to her, like special relations to China or to Russia. Uh, to Russia. So this is my hope that uh, after the Merkel era is over, the Christian Democratic Party will become much more uh, oriented towards the Atlantic Alliance and towards defense. Otherwise, we might, I don't know where we might end because everything that, Shor that Corey said, I could fully agree with um, the defense orientation of Germany has, has gone down. And currently, you know, there are many parties like Greens or the, the SPD or the left party who would uh, rather consider disarmament and unilateral disarmament steps as a means to improve international relations than, than uh, in, in investing in defense. And then we have one party, the right-wing party, uh, AFD, who wants to form a coalition with Russia. So it's sometimes very strange what is happening here. And um, 
to find a middle ground and to find a policy which uh, which is more directed towards strengthening the Atlantic Alliance, I think, is needed. But the uh, possible coalition outcomes, only one of them might lead in this direction, and it depends on Mr. Laschet and whether he is a leader. I don't know whether he's, a, he's really someone who is a good leader, but we will see. Thank you for that. Yes, we've been we've been following the polls here and, and the difference in personal popularity and dynamism, dynamism and support for CDU, CSU, the Greens as, as individual parties. And that's an interesting dynamic to watch um, in a coalition government and the way that the German voting system um, works. I wanted to, to bear down on Russia for a moment here because the Green Party's chancellor candidate, Annalena Baerbach, has actually sort of attempted in recent days to, to break with Merkel's policies. Surprisingly, you know, you mentioned peaceniks, some would, would have this outdated impression of the Green Party as peaceniks, but actually when you look at some of what she has said in recent days on both Russia and China, um, it's quite tough. It's actually the toughest of all the party positions I've, I've heard. So for example, we've heard an idea about um, imposing sanctions on Russian individuals on their real estate assets to try to compel uh, better behavior. An idea from her as well about sort of taxing uh, Chinese companies that get state-based support, a uh, kind of import duties. That's actually pretty tough talk, particularly from a Green Party that people might not have that impression of. Um, you know, Corey, I'll turn to you. What, how, how do you think, um, how do you take these statements from, from Ms. Baerbach, particularly on Russia and to some extent on China? And more importantly, what kind of a Russia policy do you think the US would like to see um, from Germany under a new coalition government? What is the ideal uh, policy, Russia, German Russia, Russia policy look like? Well, let me start with the question about um, the Green Party. It's wonderful to see them recalibrating their traditional, um, you know, peacenik stance by putting human rights and the at preservation and advance of individual liberties uh, at the core of their foreign policy. And I think that's likely to drive greater convergence, not just with the United States, but also with other European countries. Um, because uh, Chancellor, German policy under Chancellor Merkel uh, has actually been softer than the position taken by German companies for the most part uh, on human rights. And so I think it will be welcome if it should become German national policy. It will also, um, I think, uh, raise awareness among Germans. For example, I have been shocked that Volkswagen hasn't gotten more public pressure from Germans themselves about plants in Xinjiang and the relationship to forced labor in China. Uh, and so I think if the, by the Green Party putting uh, human rights and values in the center of how they are thinking about security policy, it may help raise awareness more broadly among Germans, you know, for policies that if the United States were taking, we would be getting a lot of criticism from our German colleagues about um, the cynicism and hypocrisy of our views. And so there's, Germany is overdue for more domestic conversation of that kind. Uh, and um, more broadly, I do think that, you know, China's behavior is driving a convergence among Western countries. Uh, because much as all of us would like to have this cup pass us by, it's not passing us by. We have had a strategy towards China that encourages them to come into the international order and play by the rules. That is what has made them successful so far. It's what will continue to make them successful and prosperous. And that's clearly not what the Chinese government wants for itself. Um, I think that's also clearly not what the Russian government wants for Russia. And so uh, 
Um, my ideal German policy, and I think a, a lot of Americans would have the same view towards Russia, um, would be um, less accommodationist and more solidarity with Western countries that feel preyed upon by Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, Germany doesn't feel strong to itself, but it looks strong to the rest of us. And I think at adjusting German security policy to account for Germany's actual strength and to account for the desire by smaller and less powerful states in the West for more solidarity and more leadership on Germany's part would be welcome, not just in Europe, but also by the United States. That's a really important, that's a really important message. Dr. Krause, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, let me say a few words about the Greens. Um, um, I, I don't agree with you, Corey, that this uh, really marks a change in their, in their position. They are, have always been human rights oriented, which is, is fine. But in terms of defense policy, it's still the, the old positions. They are against uh, nuclear sharing agreements. They are for uh, for, for unilateral steps, they, they do not agree with the with growing up uh, the Bundeswehr and and with the two percent goal uh, and, and so on and so on. So there are some reasonable people among the Green Party, but the party itself is still very much oriented uh, to traditional, as I call, peacenik positions. And I don't think that this will change. Mrs. Uh, Baerbock a couple of months said she is totally against the 2% solution and against the, the nuclear sharing agreement. So, um, uh, so there will be a very peace oriented policy, but a very human rights oriented critical position against Russia and China, which I find very sympathetic. But uh, on the other hand, they are still in this, in the, they, they still cling to these old uh, ideological positions. And uh, the points you raised with regard to Germany as a model for Eastern European or, or other European states, I, I, I fully agree with this. This was a case uh, until the late 1990s, you know, when Helmut Kohl was chancellor, he always consulted with the smaller European states and Germany was the champion of small European states or me medium sized. Mm -hmm. This has changed. And what I hear from my, uh, my colleagues from other European states, in particular from Eastern European states, they feel uh, ignored by, by the German government and uh, uh, in particular by Mrs. Merkel. And this is a follow on con a pro problem from the, uh, from the refugee crisis in 2050, they felt uh, being coerced to take up uh, uh, asylum, asylum seekers uh, and they, they didn't like it. And uh, in Germany, no one was ready uh, to listen to them. So there's a problem we have to solve with these, these countries because Europe is uh, no longer a unified uh, area. We have a north-south uh, divide and we have an east-west divide. And uh, I think it's the, at the, uh, it, uh, is the obligation of Germany to be the moderator, but we have failed so far. And I do not see that the Greens will help us in this regard. The Greens are considered in particular by East uh, Europeans as um, intolerant liberals <laughs> because they want to impress their, their, their point of view to the others and uh, people in, particularly East, uh, Eastern Europe, look at uh, the world totally different than we do uh, in a much more traditional way. And this has to be has to be taken into account. So I agree fully with, with what you've said, um, but Germany is not so powerful. You know, in military terms, we are currently almost zero and uh, we are a powerful econ economy, this is true but not everything uh, can, be re uh, can be solved by economic means. So I hope that we will find a, a better balance between economic means and, and uh, military means. I think that's an important distinction what you both said about security versus defense. Um, and perhaps we are closer to Germany when we're talking about economic security, security, uh, trade and, and there is space then to put this human rights agenda forward 
uh, much like the Biden administration has. But when we're talking about defense and putting money towards hard military capabilities and the 2% and the 20%, that's where we get a little bit more of, of what we've seen in the past. I'm getting a lot of questions coming from the audience and there's two that I in particular want to make time for. Um, the first is about the various candidates um, positions or party positions on the nuclear sharing arrangement within NATO. Um, you know, we know that, you know, Germany has a number of procurement plans to bring its military capabilities up to speed. Recently, we saw the procurement of, of P8s to increase situational awareness, maritime situational awareness. Um, there are a number of upgrades that are in the pipeline. Um, and some of the comments you've, you've recently made sort of give me a little bit of pause about whether those upgrades will, will continue under the next government given the, the variety of positions. But specifically with regard to the nuclear sharing arrangements involving NATO, um, I think the current CDU plat election platform explicitly endorses the continuation of that role in mission. But where do the other parties stand? Um, SPD, the Greens, um, and, and FDP, if that is, FPD, if that is uh, relevant. Uh, and Dr. Krauss, I'll start with you. Yeah, as you have mentioned, the CDU is endorsing it. The SPD is uh, rejecting it, as well as the Green Party and the left, and the left party, uh, anyhow. I haven't seen any um, position by the Liberal Party. You know, 10 years ago, they were they had a foreign minister, Mr. Westerwelle, who also wanted to get the nuclear weapons um, stationed in Germany out of the country. Uh, so currently, it's a minority position. Uh, it's a position by the Christian Democratic Union. And I don't even believe that all Christian Democrats are behind this. Um, and to put it bluntly, nuclear issues haven't been discussed in a serious way in Germany since uh, 30 years. And even at that time, a serious discussion was difficult to, to, to lead because uh, there's so many people who were so in, in uh, arguments which are uh, not necessarily very, very uh, factual. And um, so I hope that this will go through, but, but I see that this will be one of the future uh, coalition uh, uh, points of, 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 of divergence, because whoever will be in a coalition with the CDU, either the Social Democrats or the, Chris, or the, or the, or the Greens uh, will oppose it. And it, uh, it, it means a lot of, of uh, leadership by the Christian Democratic Union to say, okay, this is so important that uh, for us, it, it's, a, it's a must that you have to agree. And if uh, the other possibility is that there's a coalition led by the Social Democrats, by Mr. Scholz, uh, together with the Greens on the FDP. And then I see uh, no future for nuclear sharing agreements. Um, I see that uh, we will not uh, modernize the Bundeswehr and uh, that this will be a road for to disaster, to put it bluntly. And if I could add on to that, please, Rachel. Um, that uh, Germany, a German government taking the position to opt out of NATO's nuclear sharing would be an enormous problem for the alliance because it would collapse NATO strategy. And Germany would be expecting all other NATO, that German choice would require all other NATO countries either to bear a greater share of the burden in order to protect Germany, or to agree to fight conventional wars in Europe, as opposed to relying at the end of the day on nuclear deterrence. Uh, and so, you know, a German government that believes in multilateralism and unilaterally forces that kind of problem on the NATO allies, is going to be deeply resented by other NATO allies. Um, and uh, the conversation will go something like this. You know, Germany expects to be protected because Russia would have to fight its way through Poland to get to Germany. But if you think your Central Europeans resent Germany over Nord Stream 2, wait till you see what happens if Germany would opt out of NATO's longstanding strategy 
which includes reliance on nuclear deterrence. And it's, it sounds like that debate is not happening now. I mean, the points Corey made are, are worth bringing out into the public and understanding what those, those trade-offs are. So, you know, I understand it's not a popular election issue, but hopefully that conversation um, can come forward at some point, given the disparity in the positions of the, of the various parties and candidates. I'm also getting a lot of questions on the European Union and the EU defense identity. We touched on it at the beginning when we talked about Afghanistan and, and the ability of, of Europeans to realize more strategic autonomy or, or just a stronger defense identity. Um, where do you think, uh, Dr. Kau said, the next German government will stand in pursuing a closer defense relationship with its EU partners? Yeah, we have two options. Either we have a Christian Democratic led coalition or a coalition led by the Greens or the Social Democrats. And um, I think if there was a Christian Democrat uh, coalition led, uh, led coalition, they will, um, you know, put emphasis on NATO, but they will also uh, try to find out what the European Union members can do in order to improve nature's performance in order to make you know things easier uh, and cooperation much more more workful than it is now um if we have a, a, the other coalition a left green coalition it will mm -hmm. pursue more ideas about a european army which i think is that from the beginning uh, but this this is what the what the social democrats have uh, have always voted for they said we need a european army but i think no one has really thought this through because the european army uh, is uh, in, in my opinion in, uh, impossible under the current political condition in particular if germany as Corey rightly has said is uh, is moving out of nuclear uh, sharing agreements and it's it's turning away from the Atlantic Alliance. I see basically the danger that Germany is phasing out of NATO and uh, is getting again into a position where it's isolating itself, slowly moving, not as we have seen in the, in the German Empire, you know, at, at two, uh, 110 years ago, but there's a tendency in Germany to be more independent, to be more European, but in a way that no one in Europe would be would agree to. And this makes me a little bit concerned. <clears throat> um, so Corey, I want to turn to you on this question as well. I mean, we've seen the back and forth with the EU trying to build um, its security and defense identity all the way back, you know, from the 90s and the Petersburg task through to CSDP. And, and as you said um, earlier, it, it's really failed to get off the ground. Um, and this is a real danger when we couple that with Germany disengaging from NATO. Um, so, so Corey, what realistically do you think um, Germany supporting a more, I don't even want to use the word autonomous, but a more independent or capable EU defense capability, whether that's in an EU context or a NATO context, is, is that something the U.S. should be supportive of? And what direction should we try to push that in? I think the United States is apathetic on this subject because we've been hearing for so long. I mean, when I came into the American government in 1990, I, I was up in arms and having to figure out what to do about the Franco-German Corps because this was going to be an enormous military operation, a great strong arm of European defense outside of NATO. And does anybody think that now? Um, and so I think Americans are largely indifferent because the experience of the last 30 years of European defense is the EU wanting credit in the present for things it purports it will do in the future. And none of that resulting in greater defense capability on the part of Europeans. You know, Europeans keep telling us in NATO that, well, our public wouldn't spend more on defense for NATO, but they sure would on the EU. And that doesn't look to be 
true across 30 years of experience of it. And so, you know, I think Americans would love to see Europeans and in particular Germany willing to do a lot more for the common defense. Um, but we a little bit get exasperated with hearing about it over and over and having it produce so little. I see Dr. Krause smiling and in agreement. Um, I'll let you come on that. We're, we're almost out of time, but Dr. Krause, when you come on on that, there actually are two avenues that I do think have produced some additional capability in a European context outside of NATO. And that would be sort of Franco-German cooperation and then outside the scope of this conversation perhaps would be the UK's cooperation with France. I mean, we certainly have seen the UK and France joining alongside the US um, for kinetic strikes in Syria. We've seen the French building a pretty reasonable coalition in the Sahel using its European partners. Are there avenues within the EU or in these coalitions of the willing that could produce the kinds of results that, that Corey has articulated? There really is this, this need for proof before the US moves away from that apathy into sort of full-hearted support. Yeah, the um, armaments projects, you know, the FCAS for instance, uh, but you know, there are very different opinions on the French side and the German side concerning what these common projects should achieve. Because the French also have a very different strategic perspective. They have a more strategic pers pers perspective than we have. You know, we, the problem with Germany is that we have no, have no strategic culture, which could be called strategic. The French have one, but they have also their blind spots. You know, they look mainly to the Middle East and to, to North uh, Africa. They do not see the threat from, from Russia, for instance, as we do. And the Brits have also different perceptions. So there are inbound problems with uh, defense cooperation in Europe. And uh, this has counted for what, what Corey rightly described. There's always a lot of um, balare in, in, in Europe about what we, what we want to achieve, but we haven't achieved so much. And what we achieved was also um, has also problems, produced new problems. And, um, and this, then it comes to, you know, arms export with regard to, to common project, uh, com the results of common arms projects. Uh, there are so many differences between the French and the German and the British uh, perspective on this. And uh, it's almost insurmountable because I haven't seen any politicians in, in Germany, even within the Christian Democratic Union, was ready to accept a similar position to arms export as France is doing. So the problems are still big and I do not, I would not bet on any kind of European army or European autonomy or whatever the names are, you know. Um, I think we are very well served within the Atlantic Alliance, but we can do more in order to, you know, to have more, more um, that our weapon systems are more compatible and that we cooperate among ourselves and that we do not produce too many different weapon systems. And if we could, could achieve something of that kind, it would be already very good. All right, so we're, we're almost out of time, but, but Corey, I wanted to give you a final word. I hate to leave our viewers on such a pessimistic note that you know there's no agreement within the coalition, there's no agreement within NATO, there's no agreement among European countries. Um, you know, is there is there something as you look forward to a fresh coalition government in Germany after 16 years of, of Chancellor Merkel? Um, is there something that that you're hopeful about um, or looking forward to? Yes, I'm hopeful that an, a new German government once in power will take the opportunity to uh, look at the dangers that Germany and its allies face and become more engaged on those issues to, if they have fresh ideas, to bring fresh ideas. I guess the thing though that actually makes me hopeful is that the Atlantic Alliance, the basic bargain that underwrites the Atlantic Alliance is remarkably durable. And it's durable because Europeans actually don't have a better option 
than rubbing along allied with the United States. And the United States actually doesn't have a better option than rubbing along allied with Europe. I've looked my entire life for better allies than Europeans. And I will happily trade Europe in for better allies as soon as I can find any. But unfortunately, I can't seem to find any. And I think the same is probably true on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, so there's no substitute for persuading your close friends um, of trying to do something together when the world feels scary. That's right. Dr. Krause, a final word to you. I would fully agree with what Corey said. Uh, it's the most reasonable thing to stick to the Atlantic Alliance and to build on it. But uh, in politics, you do not always arrive at the most reasonable things where emotions are involved and all thinking and, and all kind of, of hate, uh, you know, anti-Western feelings and what have you. So it's... Um, that's the art of politics uh, to to get out of this crazy situation. Sometimes some some reasonable uh, outcomes, and I hope that the next uh, German government would do this. But I'm I'm not totally optimistic. I'm I said I, I could also be a very pessimistic uh, path that that we are going along. I hope not, but it's not excluded. Well, I thank you both for your time. Our eyes will be looking towards September 26. And as I understand it, in the immediate period after, while the coalitions are formed and, and the positions come in place. But thank you for adding to the debate and putting on the table some of these important issues that we'd like to hear more about, like nuclear sharing, like the re regeneration of, of NATO. Um, so thank you for your time and, and being discussants in this Cassius IS event. And um, all the best.